Good evening, and welcome back to our continued study of the Ark and Advent. I am Christy Bird, and I'll be leading this month of November our conversation around the Ark of the Covenant. Next month, um, my husband Darren will be leading our conversation around Advent, and we will be connecting the two as we go along. So I hope you'll continue to tune in for both all the lessons for the next um, several weeks as we connect the two. There is so much in this lesson uh, about this part of the Ark of the Covenant that I could not include. It, it, it is that we could take deep, deep dives into uh, the tabernacle, which is tonight's lesson, and there's just so much. So I have some scripture later on in the lesson that I hope you'll take a look, take time to take a look at because it's just such a rich um, subject area within the Old Testament. This lesson, once again, is a walkthrough without answers. So I have a lot of questions. My teaching style is mostly asking questions, which makes it a little bit challenging when it comes to um, doing a lesson online. I like to ask a lot of questions, so I'm going to keep doing that. So I hope that you will respond in the comments with, um, and I'll show you here in just a minute how to do that. Respond to the comments of whatever platform you're using with answers to the questions. And I've had someone call me and ask if they can text me their responses and absolutely you can. Or if you wanna email me, I won't publish my personal information on this video, but if you know how to reach me, by all means you can text me or call me or send me an email if you have, uh, if you would like to use those methods of conversation. So um, I would welcome that. I love talking about scripture and learning from my cloud of witnesses, which is all of you. So I hope you will be encouraged to respond in some way as we walk through this study. So we are, again, paralleling the Ark of the Covenant and Advent. But before we get into this week's, this week's lesson, we are going to reflect a little bit and just review the questions from last week. So apparently, I didn't realize this until just this morning, that um, I misnumbered the end of the lesson. So I think these questions were seven, eight, and nine, and they should have been 10, 11, and 12, because I already had seven, eight, and nine. So I hope that you will go back and um, respond to these. These are questions about hope, which was our connection to Advent last week with the Ark of the Covenant. And in the, the comments, if you would write um, Q10 when you're responding or Q11 or Q12 so that we know what you're answering, we would really appreciate that. Mostly because we will, be, my husband will be using your responses to these questions when he prepares his lessons for Advent. So um, we would like your, your feedback and your input in that. Question 10 was how does the Ark of the Covenant reflect hope to the Israelites? Question 11, how does this hope connect with our hope in Jesus? And question 12, why do you seek, need, or want hope yourself? So I hope you will um, be able to respond in some way to those questions. This week, we're continuing with the Ark of, of the Covenant with the glory of God, and we're going to see that in the tabernacle. So um, as we get into that, we'll dig a little deeper. But like I said, the, we could do such a deep dive into the tabernacle, which houses the Ark of the Covenant, that um, we could do a whole series of lessons on it. And I have done multiple Bible studies myself on the tabernacle, and it is just such rich text and so full of meaning uh, within the Old Testament. So I hope you'll have an opportunity to take a deep dive yourself. Before we get into our lesson, let's pray together. Father God, how good it is to be in your word. How good it is to study the wisdom of the Old Testament and discover uh, how you your provision was already put in motion for, for us now and our connection to Jesus. We love you, Lord, and we pray that we will our eyes will be opened to new revelations within your word. Amen. 
our lesson format is very similar to what we did last week. We have some historical context that we're going to cover. We're, then we're going to read the scripture and I'll read it. You won't see it on the screen. You'll just see what it, um, the passage t uh, address, so to speak. And then you'll have some, I'll, I have some visual context for you. Then after that, we're going to break the scripture down and walk through it with some questions for you to respond to. And then finally, we'll can make connections and reflections to Advent. So let's get started. Okay, so the historical context for today's passage is um, we're in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 40, and this is the end of Exodus. Uh, the uh, Israelites have left Egypt early, early on in this book, pardon me, and they have been wandering in the wilderness for quite some time, lots of grumbling, even though um, the soles of their shoes don't even wear out. They have been provided with manna. They've pro been provided with um, quail. And so they've been, been provided with food. They've been given the Ten Commandments, and um, that's when Moses was on Mount Sinai. He came down. They were worshiping Baal, and he said, uh, this isn't going to work. And they, the tablets broke, and he had to go back up and find get new tablets, basically new law from God. So all of that has already happened, and he, they, the Israelites have renewed their covenant with God, and God has renewed his covenant with them. So prior to last week's lesson on the Ark of the Covenant, that's what we've seen. We've seen that um, they renewed covenant with God, which was set out with um, Abraham, and this is kind of like a new chapter. And last week, we talked about the specifications of the Ark of the Covenant and what that is, why that is significant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box that housed the Ten Commandments, a jar of manna, and the rod of Aaron, Aaron being the first priest. And the priest comes into play in today's lesson. So um, we'll, we'll talk about the role of the priest briefly. I want to make sure I, I didn't miss anything. Nope. Okay. I checked my notes. I'll, I will keep going. All right. So I'm going to read directly from our lesson book, which our lesson books are the Smith, um, Smith Helwes Sunday School Resources. So I'm going to read directly, read Exodus 40, 16 through 21, and then 30 through 38. Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the covenant and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the curtain for the screening, for screening, pardon me, and screened the ark of the covenant as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set up the court around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the screen at the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until that day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of the journey. I have um, on this screen down here at the bottom, 
to also see Exodus 25 through 40. So beginning in Exodus 25, the final chapters of Exodus mostly include, not solely, but mostly include instructions about the tabernacle, Ark of the Covenant included. So there are some other things sprinkled in there, but most of those chapters are based on the Ark of the Covenant. So obviously, like I said, we can do a very deep dive into the um, tabernacle, pardon me, into the tabernacle. So if you have time or interest, um, take a look at Exodus chapters 25 through 40 to get, to get that big, deep picture of the, um, excuse me, the tabernacle. Let's keep going. All right, so what you're gonna see right now is my beautiful drawing of the tabernacle. So the tabernacle is a tent, and um, I'll walk you through this because it's hard to see, hard to figure out uh, according to scripture. The entrance, which is right here, over on the far right side, the entrance was to face east. The entrance is to face east face east and there are very specific instructions on how this is built the whole thing this whole thing has very specific instructions this is the outer court that goes around and it had particular number of pillars and a certain certain kinds of fabric and this is the outer court the walls kind of of the court as oh not yet as they would have walked in to the entrance, they would have first come to the brazen altar. It was made of bronze, and this is where the sacrifices would have been made on this altar. Then to the laver. Laver is a wash basin, so also made of bronze, and this would have been where they cleansed themselves after the sacrifice. After the sacrifice. This smaller square on the interior of the big one, this is the holy place. So this is another area. Um, inside is the altar of incense, which this is my rendition of smoke right here. So there was, all, there was always incense burning and it was prayers and representation of prayers. There is also the table of the bread of presence. And there were 12 loaves of bread, one for each tribe of um, Israel. And then there's all, also a lampstand inside then we see the veil or the very large curtain that behind which was the ark of the covenant and we saw the ark of the covenant last week now only the priest aaron would be allowed to enter here only the priest so moses was not allowed moses was not allowed in this area only the priest was so um that would have been aaron and then aaron was of the tribe of Levi, and the tribe of Levi was the priestly tribe. That All of the priests came from the tribe of Levi. Now you're going to see a, a real artist's rendition. <laughs> so here we have the interior of what we just saw. This would be the bread of presence or the shoe bread right here. There's the lamp, the lamp stand. This would be the altar of incense and then the curtain and then, of course, the Ark of the Covenant. So last week, we had a box, and this week, we have a tent. There are a couple of words that you're going to see in Scripture. One is the tent, a tent of meeting, and one is um, tabernacle. The tent, excuse me, the tabernacle, word, the Hebrew word for tabernacle, pardon me, tabernacle is mishkan. And the Hebrew word for tent is ohel. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing those terribly. Both of those mean dwelling place. However, a tent includes it being portable. So it's very important that we think about this tent being a dwelling place. And it would, of course, be a dwelling place for God. As we know from last week's lesson that the Ark of the Covenant is where God would meet his people, especially, particularly the priest. Okay, so now we are going to read the passage again. And this time, you, pardon me, you will see the scripture itself, all the words of the scripture. But some of the words I have made different colors 
and or highlighted a different way, underlined, made bold, stuff like that. So I want you to start to look at those and pick those out because those are the words that we're going to focus on for our discussion and our question answering. So let's take a look. Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. In the first month of the second year, pardon me, I dropped my pencil. Let's start again. In the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. So let me pause just a minute there in verse 17. The first month in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. So in prior chapters, all the instructions come for how to build the tabernacle. But in this chapter, at this moment, in verse 17, they set up the tabernacle. And it happens, probably not happens, it is New Year's Day for them. The first month, the first day of the month. This is like a new beginning. This is a new beginning to go forth with God's presence. Verse 18, Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put it in the poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the covenant and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the curtain for screening and screened the ark of the covenant as the Lord had commanded Moses. And we saw that in the picture, the curtain that screened the ark of the covenant or the holy of holies. That area was called that. Verse 30, he set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and he put the water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and feet. When they went into the tent of meeting and they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set up the court around the tabernacle and the altar and put up the screen at the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, tabernacle, that word, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. So what have you seen here in these words? You can see on this particular screen, lots of colors, a few things underlined. And we saw that earlier. Um, we have the things underlined. We have things in bold. Here's, we go back in bold. So when you start to pull all that out, here is what we end up with. So we, we're going to be talking specifically and asking questions about the tabernacle and the tent of meeting, the ark, basin, water, and washed, the altar, the cloud, and the cloud with fire, and glory, the glory of God. So we will be um, pulling each of those sections of scripture out. We have a few reflections on that pardon me, and questions for you all to, um, to answer. The first one is the longest, so bear with me. This is um, the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. So you can see, I've skipped some of the scripture, but all that whole passage, we have Exodus 40, 17 through 38, we see this repeated over and over and over. We have the tabernacle, the tabernacle, he said that he spread the tent over the tabernacle, put the covering of the tent over it. The basin was between the tent of meeting and the altar. So we saw that in the um, picture. We saw the, the um, altar, then the tent, excuse me, the altar, and then the basin, and then the tent of meeting. The basin was between the tent of meeting and the altar. Um, when they went into the tent of meeting, they approached the altar. The court was around the tabernacle. 
the cloud covered the tent of meeting. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we see this over and over. These two terms seemingly interchangeable, tent of meeting and tabernacle. So let's take a, a look at this just a moment. And I have um, some reference here to get a little bit of an understanding of why tabernacle and tent of meeting. Remember, these words mean dwelling. These words mean dwelling. And I, I am reading from the Archaeological Study Bible about the tabernacle and tent of meeting. And each name, this is what this says, each name highlights an aspect on it. Of its function of its function it was commonly known as the sanctuary some translations say dwelling because God had chosen to live there among his people and this is Exodus 25 8 God held audience with them in the tent of meeting to accept their sacrifices and forgive their sins from Exodus 28 43 and as the tabernacle of testimony Another word for this tabernacle, tent of meeting, it housed the tablets of God's covenant with his people, which were the Ten Commandments. Now, this holy place, that inner um, square that we saw earlier, according to Halley's, or is it Haley? Halley's Bible Handbook, New Revised Edition, the holy place served as a shadow of the church. We also have a couple of New Testament references for this area. First of all, in John 1, 4, it, um, I want to quote this correctly. John, excuse me, 1, 4, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we see the dwelling once again of God in the form of Jesus Christ here among us. And then in Matthew 27, 51, this is after, right at the birth, excuse me, right at the death of Jesus, where the curtain tears, the curtain that we saw that separates the Holy of Holies or where the Ark of the Covenant is. That curtain tore from top to bottom at the death of Jesus in, inside the temple. I do want to call your attention to the... Um, to the book of Hebrews in chapters 8 through 10. Chapters 8 through 10 of Hebrews is a beautiful New Testament illustration of the Old Testament tabernacle and tent of meeting. I really would encourage you to read that. So our first question actually comes from part of that passage. Question one, right here. What does Hebrews 9, 24 say about the tabernacle. So when you look up that scripture, make um, take a moment to reflect on, on that scripture, what it says about the tabernacle. It's kind of my little teaser. I, I hope you'll look that up. Hebrews 9, 24. What does the New Testament say about the Old Testament tabernacle? That's in Hebrews 9, 24. That's our first question. You ready to keep going? Lots of questions, not very many answers. Let's keep going. Okay, so now we're going to look at the ark. So he took the covenant and put it into the ark and put poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. He brought the ark into the tabernacle and um, set the curtain up that screened the ark of the covenant. So that's our next word is the ark. Halley's Bible Handbook also says that the mercy seat, which we talked about last week with the Ark of the Covenant, which is the top cover of the box, which has the two cherubim facing each other, the mercy seat is a shadow of Christ himself. The mercy seat is a shadow of Christ himself. So the question two then is, based on what we learned last week about the Ark of the Covenant and what you know about the New Testament narrative, in other words, what happens in the New Testament, the story of Jesus, if you're unfamiliar with that, um, take a look at John. That's a great place, the book of John, that's a great place to start. How is the mercy seat a shadow of Christ? So Halley's Bible handbook says, 
that the mercy seat is a shadow of Christ. But the question is, why would they say that? Why would the book say that? Why would that be the, be the insight? So what did we learn last week about the Ark of the Covenant and what you already know about the story of Jesus? Or maybe if you don't, start with the book of John. How is the mercy seat a shadow of Christ? How would you, how would you answer that? I look forward to reading your responses. Okay, let's keep going. Now we're going to talk about the basin and the water. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar. He put water in it for washing. They washed their hands and feet. And before they approached the altar, they washed again. So there, there's a lot of imagery with washing and water. What is the significance our next question, what is the significance of the basin and the water in it? Why is it there? What's significant about it? Oh, and look, I forgot to um, look at that. Let's make this Q3A. <laughs> what connection do you make from this basin to what you know of the New Testament? So I forgot to number this question, and I'm pretty sure the next slide has question four on it. So we'll call this slide, this question, pardon me, Q th question 3A, or as the previous one is three. What connection do you make from this basin, the basin in the tent of meeting in the tabernacle to what you know of the New Testament. And for a little bit of clue, if you're unfamiliar with the New Testament or if you would like a little bit of um, direction, take a look at John chapter 4 and also 1 John 5, 6 through 8 to see what you discover about basin, water, and being washed. Take a look at that. Let's keep going. So the next word we're pulling out is altar. He set the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, the altar being very significant. The altar was where the sacrifices were made. There were very particular uh, directives about how the altar was to be built. Um, there were horns on the four corners of the altar to tie the animal that was being sacrificed. So they're, again, very specific. When they went into the tent of meeting, they approached the altar. Uh, he set up court around the tabernacle and the altar. So we see that repeated. It is a very crucial, important part of the tent of meeting, of the tabernacle itself. So what is the significance of the altar? Question four. Why is it there? What is, what is it for? Why, why would he require sacrifice? And question five. What connection do you make from this altar to you, what you know about the New Testament narrative? Same kind of question that we had for the basin. So I have some scripture there for you if you're unfamiliar with the New Testament narrative or the story of the New Testament, the story of Jesus, or if you need some direction. Take a look at Matthew 27, 32 through 50, Mark 15, 21 through 39, and John 3, 16 to find what is significant about the altar. What connection can we make from the altar of the uh, Old Testament and the tabernacle, the, the tent that would travel with them throughout the wilderness to the New Testament narrative? So those are questions four and five. Next, we have the cloud. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Um, it was so thick that they couldn't even enter. Verse 36, that whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, but if the cloud wasn't, then they didn't move. So the cloud was God's presence showing them where to be. If it didn't move, they stayed. If the cloud went, they went. And then, of course, um, at night, there was a fire in the cloud so that they could see where God was leading them or, pardon me, where... Um, they were to stay. So let's take a look at this reflection and these questions. So we see that God guided the Israelites, and we saw that earlier in the book of Exodus 2. If you've taken a moment to study or, or earlier in Exodus, he leads his people by a cloud. How does God guide us? Question six. You know, when I was a kid, I would wish that God would just send me a letter 
and like write, Dear Christy, do this, this, and this. Love God. Wouldn't that be simple? Well, he did give us a letter, our scriptures, and it's just not quite as um, direct as we think it should be maybe sometimes. So um, my question then is to, like a cloud, here, go here, follow this. Oh, okay, it seems so simple. Following God isn't so simple, is it? But how does he guide us? And how do you know, how are you certain when God is leading you? What are ways that you have discerned that he, he is leading you and without a doubt, you need to follow him in that, that way? These are really personal questions. I'm so curious about how other believers um, know how God is leading them. I have my own um, ways, and maybe next week I'll talk about that. Maybe, I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll talk about that. But um, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. How, how does God lead you? How does God guide us? And how do we know that it's Him? Or how do we know when it is Him? Then the glory, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. They could not enter because the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What is the glory of the Lord? How would you describe the glory of the Lord? And we know that the Ark of the Covenant was presence of God for the Israelites. And the Ark of the Covenant was housed within the tabernacle, within the tent of meeting. Why does that matter? Why does God's presence matter? What is the glory of the Lord? How would you describe it? And why does God's presence matter? So I have another question, and it is, I'm going to show it on the screen here in just a moment. It is super deep. It's super deep. And I, I struggled with providing additional scriptures for it because I, I felt like the New Testament was, was the scripture. Um, so this is one that we may need to reflect on for a while. But I wanted to ask it because I thought it was so challenging um, as, as for, for any lesson. And the question is this. This is the super deep question. Question 11. How is the pattern of the tabernacle a parallel to the pattern to the plan of salvation? So we have this pattern in chapters 25 through 40 of Exodus. God gives this pattern of the tent that will go with the Israelites where he will dwell, where he will meet with them. It includes an altar, a laver. It faces east. It has a smaller section, the, uh, the holy place, the holy, and then the holy of holies. And inside of that, we have a lampstand. We have um, the bread of presence. We have the altar of incense. We have the curtain. We have the Ark of the Covenant. How does that pattern parallel to the pattern, the plan of salvation? I'm so curious how you would respond to that question. And that could be a whole nother Sunday school lesson itself or a series maybe, but I'm really curious um, to hear from you on, on your responses, on your responses to that. So we're almost to the end of our lesson. And again, there has just been so much in the ark, excuse me, in the um, tabernacle, lessons about the tabernacle that it's just so deep and beautiful and descriptive. And it, garners more questions than answers that we could possibly um, discuss in one lesson. So I hope you'll take time. And I would love to talk to you about it. I love talking about the tabernacle. It is just so fascinating. But we're going to um, conclu conclude with our connection to Advent. What is our connection to Advent? And you may have already figured it out based on last week's connection to Advent. Our connection to Advent is peace.
The second week of Advent is peace. So what does that mean? And here are our questions for reflection that I will put at the beginning of next week's lesson so that we can include that in the Advent lessons in December. And here are our reflection questions. How are the tabernacle and peace connected, if at all? How would you connect the tabernacle and what that pattern is and what's included in the tabernacle with peace? Or would you at all? Question 13. How would the tabernacle have brought peace to the Israelites? What do you imagine that would be? And finally, in what ways do you experience God's peace? How do you experience God's peace? Friends, it is such a privilege to get to um, lead d virtual discussion with you. I enjoy you I enjoy you all so much and I so appreciate those of you who've been able to um, respond and to reach out and ask more questions. Um, that's that's how we learn and that's how I learn and um, I'm very excited to continue these conversations with you. Over the next two weeks we'll finish up our um, lessons on the Ark of the Covenant. Last week was a box. This week is a tent. So we'll find out what next week is. And we have had um, taken a peek at hope and a peek at peace. And I look forward to your responses, to your questions, and please feel free to reach out to me um, with additional thoughts. I welcome them. Thank you all so much.